Section 23 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blind Man's Holiday, Part 1. Alas for the man and for the artist with a shifting point of perspective. Life shall be a confusion of ways to the one. The landscape shall rise up and confound the other. Take the case of Lorison. At one time he appeared to himself to be the feeblest of fools. At another, he conceived that he followed ideals so fine that the world was not yet ready to accept them. During one mood he cursed his folly. Possessed by the other, he bore himself with a serene grandeur akin to greatness, and neither did he attain the perspective. Generations before, the name had been Larson. His race had bequeathed him its fine-strung, melancholy temperament, its saving balance of thrift and industry. From his point of perspective, he saw himself an outcast from society, forever to be a shady skulker along the ragged edge of respectability, a denizen de trois quoi de monde, that pathetic spheroid lying between the hot and the demi, whose inhabitants envy each of their neighbors and are scorned by both. He was self-condemned to this opinion as he was self-exiled. Through it, to this quaint southern city a thousand miles from his former home. Here he had dwelt for longer than a year, knowing but few, keeping in a subjective world of shadows which was invaded at times by the perplexing bulks of jarring realities. Then he fell in love with a girl whom he met in a cheap restaurant, and his story begins. The Rue Chartres in New Orleans is a street of ghosts. It lies in the quarter where the Frenchman, in his prime, set up his translated pride and glory, where also the arrogant Don had swaggered and dreamed of gold and grants and ladies' gloves. Every flagstone has its grooves worn by footsteps going royally to the wooing and the fighting. Every house has a princely heartbreak, each doorway its untold tale of gallant promise and slow decay. By night the Rue Chartres is now but a murky fissure, from which the groping wayfarer sees, flung against the sky, the tangled filigree of Moorish iron balconies. The old houses of Monsieur stand yet indomitable against the sentry, but their essence is gone. The street is one of ghosts to whomsoever can see them. A faint heartbeat of the street's ancient glory still survives in a corner occupied by the Café Carabine d'Or. Once men gathered there to plot against kings and the worn presidents. They do so yet, but they are not the same kind of men. A brass button will scatter these. Those would have set their faces against an army. Above the door hangs the signboard upon which has been depicted a vast animal of unfamiliar species. In the act of firing upon this monster is represented an unobtrusive human leveling an obtrusive gun, once the color of bright gold. Now the legend above the picture is faded beyond conjecture. The gun's relation to the title is a matter of faith. The menaced animal, wearied of the long aim of the hunter, has resolved itself into a shapeless blot. The place is known as Antonio's, has the name, white upon red-lit transparency, and gilt upon the windows attests. There is a promise in Antonio, a justifiable expectancy of savory things in oil and pepper and wine, and perhaps an angel's whisper of garlic. But the rest of the name is O'Reilly, Antonio O'Reilly. The Caribbean Dior is an ignominious ghost of the Rue Chartres. The café where Bienville and Conte dined, where a prince has broken bread, is become a family restaurant. Its customers are working men and women, almost to a unit. Occasionally you will see chorus girls from the cheaper theaters and men who follow avocations subject to quick vicissitudes. But at Antonio's, name rich in bohemian promise, but tame in fulfillment, manners debonair and gay are toned down to the family standard. Should you light a cigarette, mine host will touch you on the arm and remind you 
that the proprieties are menaced. Antonio entices and beguiles from the fiery legend without, but O'Reilly teaches decorum within. It was at this restaurant that Lorison first saw the girl. A flashy fellow with a predatory eye had followed her in and had advanced to take the other chair at the little table where she stopped. But Lorison slipped into the seat before him. Their acquaintance began and grew, and now for two months they had sat at the same table each evening, not meeting by appointment, but as if by a series of fortuitous and happy accidents. After dining, they would take a walk together in one of the little city parks, or among the panoramic markets where exhibits a continuous vaudeville of sights and sounds. Always at eight o'clock their steps led them to a certain street corner, where she prettily but firmly bade him good night and left him. I do not live far from here, she frequently said, and you must let me go the rest of the way alone. But now Lorison had discovered that he wanted to go the rest of the way with her, or happiness would depart, leaving him on a very lonely corner of life. And at the same time he had made the discovery, the secret of his banishment from the society of the good laid its finger in his face and told him it must not be. Man is too thoroughly an egoist not to be also an egotist. If he loves, the object shall know it. During a lifetime he may conceal it through stress of expediency and honor, but it shall bubble from his dying lips, though it disrupt the neighborhood. It is known, however, that most men do not wait so long to disclose their passions. In the case of Lorison, his particular ethics positively forbade him to declare his sentiments, but he must needs daily with the subject and woo by innuendo at least. On this night, after the usual meal at the Carabin d'Or, he strolled with his companion down the dim old street toward the river. The Rue Chartres perishes in the old Palace de Arms. The ancient Calbido, where Spanish justice fell like hail, faces it, and the cathedral, another provincial ghost, overlooks it. Its center is a little iron-railed park of flowers and immaculate graveled walks, where citizens take the air of evenings. Pedestaled high above it, the general sits his cavorting steed, with his face turned stonily down the river toward English turn, whence comes no more Britons to bombard his cotton bales. Often the two sat in the square, but tonight Lorison guided her past the stone-stepped gate and still riverward. As they walked, he smiled to himself to think that all he knew of her, except that he loved her, was her name, Nora Greenway, and that she lived with her brother. They had talked about everything except themselves. Perhaps her reticence had been caused by his. They came at length upon the levee and sat upon a great prostrate beam. The air was pungent with the dust of commerce. The great river slipped yellowly past. Across it Algiers lay, a longitudinous black bulk against a vibrant electric haze sprinkled with exact stars. The girl was young and of the piquant order. A certain bright melancholy pervaded her. She possessed an untarnished pale prettiness, doomed to please. Her voice, when she spoke, dwarfed her theme. It was the voice capable of investing little subjects with large interest. She sat at ease, bestowing her skirts with that little womanly touch, serene, as if the begrimed pier were a summer garden. Lorison poked the rotting boards with his cane. He began by telling her that he was in love with someone to whom he durst not speak of it. And why not, she asked, accepting swiftly his fatuitous presentation of a third person of straw. My place in the world, he answered, is none to ask a woman to share. I am an outcast from honest people. I am wrongly accused of one crime and am, I believe, guilty of another. Thence he plunged into the story of his abdication from society. The story, pruned of his moral philosophy, deserves no more than the slightest touch. It is no new tale, that of the gambler's declension. During one night's sitting he lost, and then had imperiled a certain amount of his employer's money, which by accident he carried with him. He continued to lose, 
to the last wager, and then began to gain, leaving the game a winner to a somewhat formidable sum. The same night his employer's safe was robbed. A search was had. The winnings of Lorison were found in his room, their total forming an accusative nearness to the sum purloined. He was taken, tried, and through incomplete evidence, released, smutched with the sinister devoirs of a disagreeing jury. It is not in the unjust accusation, he said to the girl, that my burden lies, but in the knowledge that from the moment I staked the first dollar of the firm's money I was a criminal, no matter whether I lost or won. You see, why is it impossible for me to speak of love to her? It is a sad thing, said Nora, after a little pause, to think what very good people there are in the world. Good, said Lorison. I was thinking of this superior person whom you say you love. She must be a very poor sort of creature. I do not understand. Nearly, she continued, as poor a sort of creature as yourself. You do not understand, said Lorison, removing his hat and sweeping back his fine light hair. Suppose she loved me in return and were willing to marry me. Think, if you can, what would follow. Never a day would pass, but she would be reminded of her sacrifice. I would read a condescension in her smile, a pity even in her affection. That would madden me. No, the thing would stand between us forever. Only equals should mate. I could never ask her to come down upon my lower plane. An arc light faintly shone upon Lorison's face. An illumination from within also pervaded it. The girl saw the rapt, ascetic look. It was the face either of Sir Galahad or Sir Fool. Quite star-like, she said, is this unapproachable angel, really too high to be grasped? By me, yes. She faced him suddenly. My dear friend, would you prefer your star fallen? Lorison made a wide gesture. You push me to the bald fact, he declared. You are not in sympathy with my argument, but I will answer you so. If I could reach my particular star to drag it down, I would not do it. But if it were fallen, I would pick it up and thank heaven for the privilege. They were silent for some minutes. Nora shivered and thrust her hands deep into the pockets of her jacket. Lorison uttered a remorseful exclamation. I'm not cold, she said. I was just thinking. I ought to tell you something. You have selected a strange confidant. But you cannot expect a chance acquaintance picked up in a doubtful restaurant to be an angel. Nora, cried Lorison. Let me go on. You have told me about yourself. We have been such good friends. I must tell you now what I never wanted you to know. I am worse than you are. I was on the stage. I sang in the chorus. I was pretty bad, I guess. I stole diamonds from the prima donna. They arrested me. I gave most of them up, and they let me go. I drank wine every night a great deal. I was very wicked, but... Lorison knelt quickly by her side and took her hands. Dear Nora, he said exultingly, it is you, it is you I love. You never guessed it, did you? Tis you I meant all the time. Now I can speak. Let me make you forget the past. We have both suffered. Let us shut out the world and live for each other. Nora, do you hear me say I love you? In spite of? Rather say because of it. You have come out of your past noble and good. Your heart is an angel's. Give it to me. A little while ago, you feared the future too much to even speak. But for you, not for myself. Can you love me? She cast herself, wildly sobbing, upon his breast. Better than life than truth itself, than everything. And my own past, said Lorenson, with a note of solicitude, can you forgive and... I answered you that, she whispered, when I told you I loved you. She leaned away and looked thoughtfully at him. If I had not told you about myself, would you have, would you? No, he interrupted. I would never have let you know I loved you. I never would have asked you this, Nora. Will you be my wife? She wept again. Oh, believe me, I am good now. I am no longer wicked. I will be the best wife in the world. Don't think I am bad any more. If you do, I shall die. I shall die. While he was consoling her, she brightened up, eager and impetuous. Will you marry me tonight, she said. Will you prove it that way? I have a reason for wishing it to be tonight. 
Will you? Of one of two things was his exceeding frankness the outcome, either of importunate brazenness or of utter innocence. The lover's perspective, certainly only the one. The sooner, said Lorison, the happier I shall be. What is there to do, she asked. What do you have to get? Come, you should know. Her energy stirred the dreamer to action. A city directory first, he cried gaily, to find where the man lives who gives licenses to happiness. We will go together and rout him out. Cabs, cars, policemen, telephones, and ministers shall aid us. Father Rogan shall marry us, said the girl with ardor. I will take you to him. An hour later, the two stood at the open doorway of an immense, gloomy brick building in a narrow and lonely street. The license was tight in Nora's hand. Wait here a moment, she said, till I find Father Rogan. She plunged into the black hallway, and the lover was left standing, as it were, on one leg outside. His impatience was not greatly taxed. Gazing curiously into what seemed to be the hallway of Erebus, he was presently reassured by a stream of light that bisected the darkness far down the passage. Then he heard her call, and fluttered lampward like the moth. She beckoned him through a doorway into the room whence emanated the light. The room was bare of nearly everything except books, which had subjugated all its space. Here and there, little spots of territory had been reconquered. An elderly, bald man, with a superlatively calm, remote eye, stood by a table with a book in his hand, his fingers still marking a page. His dress was somber and appertained to a religious order. His eye denoted an acquaintance with a perspective. Father Rogan, said Nora, this is he. The two of ye, said Father Rogan, want to get married? They did not deny it. He married them. The ceremony was quickly done. One who could have witnessed it and felt its scope might have trembled at the terrible inadequacy of it to rise to the dignity of its endless chain of results. Afterward, the priest spake briefly, as if by rote, of certain other civil and legal addenda that either might or should, at a later time, cap the ceremony. Lorison tendered a fee which was declined, and before the door closed after the departing couple, Father Rogan's book popped open again where his finger marked it. In the dark hall, Nora whirled and clung to her companion, tearful. Will you never, never be sorry? At last she was reassured. At the first light they reached upon the street, she asked him the time, just as she had each night. Lorison looked at his watch, half past eight. Lorison thought it was from habit that she guided their steps toward the corner where they always parted. But arrived there, she hesitated and then released his arm. A drugstore stood on the corner, its bright, soft light shone upon them. "'Please leave me here as usual tonight,' said Nora sweetly. "'I must. I would rather you would. You will not object. At six tomorrow evening I will meet you at Antonio's. I want to sit with you there once more, and then I will go where you say.' She gave him a bewildering bright smile and walked swiftly away. Surely it needed all the strength of her charm to carry off this astounding behavior. It was no discredit to Lorison's strength of mind that his head began to whirl. Pocketing his hands, he rambled vacuously over to the druggist's windows and began assiduously to spell over the names of the patent medicines therein displayed. As soon as he had recovered his wits, he proceeded along the street in an aimless fashion. After drifting for two or three squares, he flowed into a somewhat more pretentious thoroughfare, a way much frequented by him in his solitary ramblings. For here was a row of shops devoted to traffic in goods of the wildest range of choice, handy works of art, skill and fancy, products of nature and labor from every zone. Here for a time he loitered among the conspicuous windows, where was set, emphasized by congested floods of light, the cunningest spoil of the interiors. There were few passers, and of this Lorison was glad. He was not of the world. For a long time he had touched his fellow man only at the gear of a leveled cogwheel at right angles, 
and upon a different axis. He had dropped into a distinctly new orbit. The stroke of ill fortune had acted upon him, in effect, as a blow delivered upon the apex of a certain ingenious toy, the musical top, which, when thus buffeted while spinning, gives forth, with scarcely retarded motion, a complete change of key and chord. Strolling along the Pacific Avenue, he experienced singular, supernatural calm, accompanied by an unusual activity of brain. Reflecting upon recent affairs, he assured himself of his happiness in having won for a bride the one he had so greatly desired. Yet he wondered mildly at his dearth of active emotion. Her strange behavior in abandoning him without valid excuse on his bridal eve aroused in him only a vague and curious speculation. Again he found himself contemplating with complacent serenity the incidents of her somewhat lively career. His perspective seemed to have been queerly shifted. As he stood before a window near a corner, his ears were assailed by a waxing clamor and commotion. He stood close to the window to allow passage to the cause of the hubbub, a procession of human beings which rounded the corner and headed in his direction. He perceived a salient hue of blue and a glitter of brass about a central figure of dazzling white and silver and a ragged wake of black bobbing figures. End of Blind Man's Holiday, Part 1